Income tax 2023-2024. Business use of your home, figuring the deduction part number two. Get ready and some coffee because we need to save some money for vacation with the help of income tax preparation 2023-2024. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our CPA six-pack shirts, a must-have for any pool or beach time. Mixing money with muscle, always sure to attract attention. Yeah, even if you're not a CPA, you need this shirt. So you can like pull in that iconic CPA six-pack stomach muscle vibe, man. You know, that CPA six-pack everyone envisions in their mind when they think CPA. Yeah, as a CPA, I actually and unusually don't have tremendous abs. However, I was blessed with a whole lot of belly hair. Yeah, allowing me to sculpt the hair into a nice CPA six-pack-like shape which is highly attractive. Yeah, may maybe the shirt will help you generate some belly hair too. And if it does, make sure to let me know. Maybe I'll try wearing it on my head. A and yes, I know six pack isn't spelled right, but three letters is more efficient than four. So I trimmed it down a bit, okay? It's an improvement. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Most of this information can be found in publication 946, How to Depreciate Property, Section 179, Deduction, Special Depreciation Allowance, Makers, Listed Property, and More, Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Remember, in the first half of the income tax formula, Basically, a funny income statement. Most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income. Here, having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income. The Schedule C rolling into line one income of the formula. Remembering the Schedule C itself is also basically an income statement. Having business income minus business expenses, which you could call business deductions resulting in, in essence, net business income, which is what rolls in from the Schedule C to line one income of the formula. This tax formula outlining the calculation on the Form 1040, of which we see the first page here, the Schedule C ultimately rolling in to line number eight. Additional income from Schedule 1. This is the Schedule 1. Additional income and adjustments to income. Part number 1. Additional income. The Schedule C rolling into line 3. Business income. This is the Schedule C. Profit or loss from business. Having a P&L profit and loss or income statement format. Income minus expenses. The expenses, basically business deductions, where we're focused in on now. Usually the largest category having the most different items within it. Some expenses or business deductions being more difficult than others, such as those related to the home office. Why? Because as we've discussed in prior presentation, with the home office, we have to determine if the home office qualifies, and if it does, we have to break out the bookkeeping in some way, shape, or form between the business side of things and the personal side of things, which is something that normally cannot be perfectly done on the bookkeeping side, and therefore, we're going to have to make some kind of tax adjustment, which is going to be some kind of bookkeeping work that we'll have to keep track of for the, the business use of the home office. So we're continuing on with the discussion of the home office here. And we were discussing in the prior presentation, well, if you own the home, then you might be able to put the home on the books if the part that is for business as basically an asset and then depreciate that asset over the useful life, a calculation that gets somewhat complex uh, because you're dealing with a personal piece of property, your home, that has a business component to it, the business office, we have to determine the amount that's going to go on the books as an asset, the breakout between the business and the personal, as well as the breakout between the depreciable part of the home, the building part, 
versus the land part. Then what if there are improvements to the home? In other words, if we had repairs on the home, such as we painted like the, the, the inside of the home or something like that, if it doesn't qualify as an improvement, but rather a repair, then we might be able to allocate that expense between the business and personal if it was for the entire home. If we had a repair that was for the office itself, you would think we would be able to deduct the whole thing. But if it was a repair on the home in general, you would think we would allocate between business and personal. But if it's an improvement on the entire home, such as a new roof or something like that, then you would think you would have to put that also on the books as an asset, depreciating it, but only being able to depreciate the portion that is business related, as opposed to basically like adjusting the basis of the home, which is already basically on the books. We talked about this a bit in depreciation in a prior course or section. All right, so a permanent improvement increases the value of the property, adds to its life, or gives it a new or different use. In other words, there's a difference between an improvement and a repair. If it does these things, adds to the life and so on, then it's likely it has to be an improvement, which is not good for taxes because we would rather typically it be a repair that we can just expense getting the full deduction as soon as possible, or at least the business portion of the expense as soon as possible, as opposed to having to put it on the books and depreciate it, which is both complex and makes it so we don't get the benefit as soon as we otherwise would, much later getting the benefits, by the way, because obviously the useful life of property, real estate, is quite long, and we don't get the accelerated depreciation method. We're probably going to have to use straight line, half year or half month, and so on. So examples of improvements are... Uh, replacing electric wiring or plumbing, adding a new roof or addition, paneling or remodeling. So you must carefully distinguish between repairs and improvements. See repairs earlier under actual expenses. You must also keep accurate records of these expenses. So these records will help you decide whether an expense is deductible or a capital added to the basis expense. However, if you make repairs as a part of an extensive remodeling or restoration of your home, the entire job is an improvement. Example, so you buy an older home and fix it up rooms uh, as a beauty salon. So you patch the plaster on the ceiling and walls, paint, repair the floor, install an outside door, and install new wiring, plumbing, and other equipment. Normally, the pitching, painting, and floor work are repairs and the other expenses are permanent improvements. However, because the work gives your property a new use, the entire remodeling job is a permanent improvement and its cost is added to the basis of the property. You, can deduct, uh, you cannot deduct any portion of it as a repair expense because we're basically changing the use of the property. Again, that's not as good as what we would rather have be able to do as we would like to be able to deduct as much as possible as soon as possible as repairs rather than put it on the books as an asset because we would get the deduction typically sooner uh, in that case. So we have to be mindful of that. That could be a significant difference in certain circumstances. So adjusting for depreciation deduction in earlier years. Decrease the basis of your property by the depreciation you deducted or could have deducted on your tax return under the method of depreciation you properly selected. If you deducted less depreciation than you could have under the method you selected, decrease the basis by the amount you could have deducted under that method. If you did not deduct any depreciation, decrease the basis by the amount you could have deducted. So if you deducted more depreciation than you should have, decrease your basis by the amount you should have deducted, plus the part of the expense of the excess depreciation you deducted that actually decreased your tax liability for any year. And if you deducted the incorrect amount of depreciation, you could see publication 946, How to Depreciate Property. So when we're thinking about depreciation, you can kind of compare this, of course, to the equipment. If you buy the equipment, you bought the $10,000 piece of equipment, it's business related. In that case, we would like to expense it up front, but they're going to make us put it on the books as an asset, depreciating it over its useful life. 
Now, we might still be able to deduct it in the first year because of 179 or special depreciation, but if there's any basis left over, I have to use the maker's depreciation and depreciate it over its useful life. As we do that, we basically have the cost, the $10,000, and the question in that case is, when do I get the tax benefit? Do I get it when I bought it? meaning all of it is expended and I get the tax benefit as an expense at the point of purchase, or do I have to allocate it over the useful life, meaning I should still get that full $10,000 over the useful life of, of it. Now, notice that as I consume the basis, as I consume the $10,000, the adjusted basis goes down. That means the potential deduction is going down over the life of the item. So if I was to sell it, then I would have most likely a gain if I over depreciated it, the sales price minus the adjusted basis. Now, again, when you're thinking about the home, the problems with the home is that when you start to use the home for a business, you, you might have already purchased the home in the past. So you have to figure out what the a basis is at this point in time, which you would think would still be like the cost of the home if you purchased it, although that could be complicated because you might have inherited it or something like that but you would still think it would be, you'd have to figure out the basis basically of the home and then figure out the cost that's gonna be allocated, the basis between the land of the home and the building of the home, which is difficult because if you bought the home, you paid a lump sum for both land and building, but only the building part is depreciable, possibly being able to use once again, property tax statements, which often break out between the building and the land and you can use a ratio calculation to figure out the actual cost between building and land possibly. And then as you depreciate any portion of the, of the property, then you would think that's going to, uh, going to reduce the adjusted basis. It reduces the potential tax benefits you're gonna be getting you know, in the future as time goes. Once it's on the depreciation schedules, it'll be pretty easy to see because as you depreciate it, the adjusted basis will be adjusted with the depreciation schedules. If there's an error in the depreciation calculation, that causes a problem because the depreciation calculation is gonna be applied over multiple years. And the question is, what do you do at that point? Do you go back and amend the tax return or try to fix it uh, in the current period? And that situation, you could take a look at publication 946, but what we would like to do is get it correct the first time out measure twice cut once that's the adage we want to apply this here so uh fair market value defined the fair market value of your home is the price at which the property uh, would change hands between a buyer and seller neither having to buy and both having reasonable knowledge of the necessary facts so now we have this concept of the fair market value which is again really difficult when you're dealing with real estate because the concept is sound, but real estate is unique. So the, the, the idea of having the fair market value between a buyer and a seller that have all the information they need is good, but it's hard to do in practice because unlike buying and trading stock, which is always trading on a stock exchange and therefore easy to value at any given time, we have the uniqueness of the building. So we could try to use appraisals and approximations, but they are just that approximations. Sales of similar property on or about the date you begin using your home for business may be helpful in determining the property's fair market value. That's one of the ways you can conduct kind of like an appraisal type of technique, looking at property near yours that is selling and looking at the recent prices of those properties. Figuring the depreciation deduction for the current year. So if you begin using your home for business in 2023, continue to use the same depreciation method you used in past tax years. However, if you figured your depreciation for business use of the home using the simplified method in a prior year, you will need to use the, the uh, optional depreciation table for modified accelerated cost recovery system makers property see publication 946 for the optional uh, depreciation tables in other words you could use the, the simplified method in which ways in which case we don't have to deal with the depreciation schedules or you can use the actual method in which case you do have to deal with a depreciation situation what if you're what if you're switching in one year from the simplified method to the actual method, well, that's gonna get complicated because typically the depreciation 
is something that's going to going to impact multiple years into the future and usually you need kind of consistency with that so if so it's not often the case you're going to be going back and forth between the simplified and and actual method because usually if you're in a high cost of living area the actual method will be more beneficial and you're probably going to be sticking with that from year to year but in theory you can imagine a situation where you're switching so for more information about the simplified method see revenue procedure 213-13 uh, dash 06 IRB 478 available at the IRS website. If you begin using your home for business for the first time in 2023, depreciate the business part as non residential real property under makers, which has a substantially long life, right? So, under makers, non residential real property is depreciated using the straight line method over 39 years. So for more information, so that means that the depreciation per year is going to be fairly small because although the cost of the home is most likely large, much of it's going to be allocated to land. You can only depreciate the portion allocated to the building and you're going to get the depreciation over a long life, 39 years, and you're only going to be able to depreciate the portion that's going to be allocated to the business use as opposed to the personal. All right, so for more information on makers and other methods of depreciation, you can see publication 946. We talked about makers a bit in prior presentation or section. To figure the depreciation deduction, you must first figure the part of the cost of your home that can be depreciated, depreciable basis. The depreciable basis is figured by multiplying the percent of your home used for business by the smaller of the following. The adjusted basis of your home, excluding land, land has to be removed, it's not depreciable, and it's difficult to do because you buy it, when you buy it, it has land included, so you have to use some kind of allocation, possibly with the property taxes. On the date you began using your business, began using your home for business, and the fair market value of your home, excluding land, on the date you began using your home for business. Let's say that one more time. The depreciation basis it figured by multiplying the percent of your home used for business by the smaller of the following. The adjusted basis of your home, excluding land, on the date you, you began using your home. So that's going to be the cost adjusted for you know prior depreciation, if any depreciation was taken in the past and so on and the fair market value of your home excluding land on the date you began using your home for business all right depreciation table in 2023 if 2023 was the first year you used your home for business you can figure your 2023 depreciation for the business part of your home by using the appropriate percentage from the following table so this is the makers percentage table for 39 non-residential real property clearly software can help you with these calculations as well if you look back at our prior presentations on depreciation in general then you'll know that makers usually most equipment that is like three five or seven year property is depreciated using a half year convention with a uh, a double declining balance is or a mid quarter uh, convention in some cases if you bought stuff at the end of the year but real property real estate typically is going to have a longer useful life this is non-residential real estate 39 years typically the maker's depreciation system will be the straight line method and instead of a half year convention it'll be a mid-month convention typically meaning we assume that we made the purchase are you know in the middle of the month is going to be the general idea if it's part of the year multiply the depreciation basis of of the business part of your home by the percent from the table for the first month you use your home for business so see publication 946 for the percentages for the remaining tax years of the recovery period obviously tax software helps with that but let's take a look at an example in may frankie began to use one room at home exclusively and regularly to meet clients. This room is 8% of the square footage of the home. So how did he figure that? We took the square footage of the place, of his room, divided by the square footage of the home, you would think, would be your ratio analysis, meaning 8% is the ratio. So Frankie bought their home. Here we go with the there thing again. Frankie's a, a there. Fra Frankie bought their home. <laughs> It's so weird. 
their home in 2008 for $125,000. Okay, so Frankie determined from the property tax records that the adjusted basis in the house, uh, exclusive of land, is $115,000. In May, the house had a fair market value of $165,000. So, so it went up in value. Good for Frankie. That's nice for him. That the, the or if that's nice for they, <laughs> the, the property went up in value. So for so Frankie multiplies the adjusted basis. So why the adjusted basis and not the fair market value? Because it was lower. So the adjusted basis is one hundred fifteen thousand, which is less than the fair market value by the eight percent. The result is nine thousand two hundred dollars. The depreciable basis for the business part of the home. So Frankie files their return based on the calendar year. So May is the fifth month of the tax year. Frankie multiplies the depreciable basis of $9,200 by 1.605. The percentage from the table for the for the fifth month, Frankie's depreciation deduction is $147.66. So notice how small the depreciation deduction is even though the cost is is fairly high that we're taking a look at here why because again we're allocating this over a long useful life 39 years we only have eight percent of it's going to be used for business uh that that we're going to have and we had the the partial year uh that we're going to be dealing with in the in the in the current year so you get so it's going to eat into it a lot depreciation uh, permanent improvements, depreciating permanent improvements. So add the cost of permanent improvements made before you began using your home for, for business to the basis of your property. In other words, if you had the cost of the property and then you made improvements on it before you started depreciating it, then you're going to start depreciating it at that adjusted basis, which includes the cost of the improvements rather than putting them on the books as two separate items. Depreciate these costs as part of the cost of your home as explained earlier. So that would just be your basis going forward. The cost of improvements made after you begin. Now, this in this case, you've already been depreciating. Your home's on the books. You don't want to mess it up with the improvements by then adjusting the cost of the thing that's already on the depreciation schedules. And therefore, you're typically going to have to have two line items, one for the original amount and then the improvements that you made after the point that you started depreciating it. So the cost of the improvements made after you begin using your home for business that affect the business part of your home, such as a new roof, are depreciated separately. So multiply the cost of the improvement by the business use percentage and depreciate the result over the recovery period that would apply to your home if you began using it for business at the same time as the improvement. So for improvements made this year, the recovery period is 39 years. So in other words, you could have had the prior property on the books for a long period of time. And if it was in the books way in the past, you might have been using some other depreciation method because it would have changed over the law might have changed. When you put the improvement on the books, you're going to put it on the books as though it's in the current year, like you purchased the home in the current year, meaning you're going to be using that 39 year method that we talked about because that's the type of property is. So for the percentage to use for the first year, uh, see table two for more information on recovery periods. You can see publication 946, business percentage. So we've been talking about this business percent. We hinted on how to do it, but conceptually is one thing. Let's get down to the nuts and the bolts, how to put the things together. You, they have little, you screw them. It's, a, it's the, uh, the, the threading is how you do it. But to find the business percent, compare the size of the part of your home that you use for business to the whole house. So we're going to use a ratio analysis, of course. And so use the resulting percent to figure the business part of the expenses for operating your entire home. So again, you might get more specific than that, of course. You might say, well, I have, you know, five rooms in the home. One room is business. So is the ratio going to be one divided by five? Probably not because some rooms in your home are a lot smaller than others. I do all my business work is done in the in the bathroom, right? And that's a pretty small home. So one fifth doesn't sound, you know, it's exclusive business in that bathroom. That's what I'm, to that's what I, so you would think that's not gonna be right because that's the smallest room 
in the home typically. So you would think that you'd have to use some kind of square footage analysis. I don't think you can deduct the bathroom as your business expense typically. That's not really going to work. But I thought it was kind of fun. Anyway, so you'd have to use some kind of square footage analysis of the room or space, remembering that it doesn't necessarily need to be a whole separate room. You don't need a separate wall, basically, but it has to fulfill the requirements we talked about in the prior presentation. So you can use any reasonable method to determine the business percent. So you would think, like if they asked you, you, you say, well, I used one fifth because I used one room out of five rooms in the home or something like that. But again, if an auditor was to audit you and your office is in the closet and you call that a room, then they're probably going to say, well, that's not really a reasonable allocation because that room is not the same size as all the other rooms. So you would think a square footage calculation would be somewhat more reasonable. So the following are two commonly used methods for figuring the percent. So you could divide the area length multiplied by width used for business by the total area of your home. So if you don't know the area of the space that you're in, it's kind of tedious, but you can get out the good old ruler and just basically count the length versus the width, right? And that's going to be the area. You probably have the area for the home because that's probably listed on the purchasing and so on and so forth. Although you got to be a little bit careful in terms of the home versus the entire property versus the property plus the, an extent, you know, whatever else is connected to it and so on. Anyways, if the rooms in the home are all about the same size, you can divide the number of rooms used for business by total number of rooms in your home. So that's the example that we used. Again, if everything was the same size, that might work. A lot of the homes that I'm looking at, or I think they're trying to be bigger space-wise if they're family locations, which might have a very large you know, living area and smaller bedrooms or something like that, which you would think that it might not be reasonable to use that ratio kind of calculation. So I think your safest bet is probably some kind of square footage calculation. Example, your office is 240 square feet. How do I know? Because I took the ruler and I went boom, boom, boom. It was 12 by 20 feet. And then I multiplied together to get the 240. Your home is 1,200 square feet. How do I know? Because I looked that up when I purchased the home and it gave me that number. So I'm good on that one. Your office is 20%. So that's going to be the 240 divided by the 1,200 of the total area of your home, 20% business. So your business percent is 20%. Example number two. So you use one room in your home for business. Your home has 10 rooms, all about equal size. Again, that's kind of weird with the houses that I've seen that all the rooms are equal size. But if that were the case, that's like measuring how many chickens can fit into a chicken coop and you and you and you assume all the chickens are around around chickens or something you know it did, i don't know it doesn't seem it seems a little too overestimate to me but if you did that your office is 10 percent of the total area of your home so your business percent is 10 percent deduction limit so if your gross income from business use of your home equals or exceeds your total business expenses, including depreciation, you can deduct all your business expenses related to the use of home. If your gross income from the business use of your home is less than your total business expenses, your deduction for certain expenses for the business use of your home is limited. In other words, you're looking at your income statement. You have income minus expenses. As long as you have income to consume the deduction of your home office, then you'll probably be allowed to get the deduction, not going to be limited by the income. But remember that the IRS is skeptical of losses because if your Schedule C comes out to a loss, then you might be able to take that loss against other income. And the IRS is your silent partner, but they're only your partner when you make money. They don't like it when you lose money. They don't want to give you money and pay for your losses or anything like that, right? So when you have losses, then that could be beneficial for taxes because losses in the business might be able to be deducted elsewhere, such as against W-2 income, but the IRS might limit some of those losses, such as for the home office might have some limitations with regards to the deductions you can take for the home office. That's why they're at the bottom of the Schedule C so that they can apply some of those uh, those limitations possibly in the amount that you can deduct related to the home office 
there. So your deduction for otherwise non-deductible expenses, such as insurance, utilities, depreciation, and your home with depreciation of your home taken last uh, that are allocable to the business is limited to the gross income from the business use of your home minus the sum of the following. So the business part of expenses you could deduct even if you did not use your home for business, such as mortgage interest, real estate taxes, and casualty losses attributable to the federally declared disaster if you itemize deductions on Schedule A. In other words, we're trying to figure out the limitation here, but some deductions you might have still been able to get a tax benefit even though you didn't get it on the Schedule C because you get those Schedule A deductions. So we have to take that into consideration when looking at the limitation. Obviously, tax software can help us with these calculations. So in other words, if you can't, obviously, if we're limited to taking deductions that could have been deducted on the Schedule A, like mortgage interest on the home, property taxes, then if we can't get it on the, on the Schedule C, then we could probably take those deductions on the Schedule A if we're taking itemized deductions. Okay, federally declared that or net qualified disaster losses if you claim the standard deduction. All right, the business expenses that relate to the business activity for the home, for example, business phone, supplies, and depreciation on equipment, but not to the use of the home itself. So if you are self-employed, do not include in two above your deduction for one half of your self-employment tax. All right, carryover of unallowed expenses. If your business expenses related to the home are greater than the current year's limit, you can carry over the excess to the next year in which you use actual expenses. So this is often the case. Remember that if, if you have a business and you have sufficient income, then typically you can take expenses against the income and, and you're fine there. But if you have losses, then the IRS is likely to limit you in some ways. Oftentimes, if they limit the amount of expenses that you can have and they're legitimate expenses, then you would think it would be unfair not to ever get the expenses, right? So, so the question then would be, can I take those expenses in a prior year or can possibly I move them over into current following years? In other words, if I have income in next year, maybe I can take the expenses against the business income in the next year. That's what we would kind of expect to happen. Anytime we have this carryover situation, by the way, it's useful to use the same tax software from year to year because it'll help you with that carryover situation. Anytime you have a complex return, whether it be a new client or a continuing client, if it were a new client, for example, if you had a Schedule C business, I would start by entering the data in the prior tax return and using the rollover because that will make it more likely that I've got my depreciation schedules correctly and I have any carryovers that are going to be populated properly with the help of the software. Just a tip there. So they are subject to the deduction limit for that year. So then you're going to carry them over, do the same thing. If there wasn't any income or some somewhat, then it could be subject to the same kind of limitations, whether or not you live in the same home during that year. All right, figuring, figuring the deduction limit and carryover. So if you are a partner or you file Schedule F, Form 1040, uh, use the worksheet to figure the deduction for business use of your home near the end of this publication. If you file Schedule C, Form 1040, that's our main point of focus here, figure your deduction limit and, and carry over on Form 8829. We'll take a look at the form in a little bit more detail when we do the tax software example. Let's take a look at a, at a words example right now. So you meet the requirements for deducting expenses for the business use of your home. You use 20% of your home for business. We did that with the little calculation, square footage of the office versus the entire home. So you are itemizing deductions on Schedule A. So if you own the home, you might likely be itemizing because the thing that pushes people over from a standard deduction to itemized deductions is usually the home ownership because of the loan related to the home having mortgage interest deductible and real estate taxes related to the home possibly pushing people over. However, those two items, real estate taxes and the uh, interest on the home, are things that might need to be allocated as well 
if you have a Schedule C business and a home office deducting part for the home office Schedule C, part for the Schedule A. Okay, so you are itemizing your deductions on Schedule A Form 1040 and your home mortgage interest in total state and local taxes would not be limited on Schedule A if you had not used your home for business. So in 2023, your business expenses and the expenses for the business use of your home are deducted from your gross income in the following order. So gross income uh, from the business, uh, gross income from the business, 6,000 minus deductible mortgage interest, 20% of the mortgage interest, the 6,000 business expenses not related to the use of your home, uh, 100% because they're not related to the deduction limit, 1,000 minus other expenses allocable to business use of the home, maintenance, insurance, utilities. These are the ones that are being allocated at that 20% rate. Other expenses up to the uh, deduction limit, depreciation carry over uh, to 2024. So you have the 1,600 minus the 200 subject to deduction limit in uh, 2024. So in other words, we were limited here to the, to, to the deduction and we have a carry forward for 2024. And of course, tax software can help us once again with this calculation and can also help us with the carry forward as we roll forward to the following year uh, and helping with the calculation in that year. So you can deduct all of the business part of your deductible mortgage interest and real estate taxes, the 3000. You can also deduct all your business expenses not related to the use of your home, uh, 2000. Additionally, you can deduct all the business part of your expenses for maintenance, insurance, utilities, because the total 800 is less than the 1000 deduction limit. Your, depreci your deduction for depreciation for the business use of your home is limited to 200, which is the 1000 minus the 800 because of the deduction limit. So in other words, you can, you can see the, I don't want to get into too much into the weeds here, but you can see when there's a loss, you could have a limitation and then you have to go into a specific order of which items are going to be allowable. In part, we have this issue that we discussed up top due to the fact that you would have got the deductions anyways for these items, mortgage interest and the, the uh, taxes, property taxes, because you would have been able to deduct them in this scenario on the schedule a so that's so so you get those deductions and then you're basically the thing that was allocated last was this item for the deductibility of the depreciation and that's the part basically that they're applying the limitation to and then you're not going to get it in the current year or part of it in the current year which is the part that's going to flow through possibly to the next year in which case you might be able to take it next year if you have sufficient business income to cover it so you can carry over the 1,400 balance and add it to your depreciation for 2024 subject to your deduction limit in 2024. More than one place of business. So if part of the gross income from your trade or business is from the business use of part of your home and part is from a place other than your home, you must determine the part of your gross income from the business use of your home before you figure the deduction limit. So in making this determination, consider the time you spend at each location, the business investment in each location, and any other relevant facts and circumstances tip. So if your home office qualifies as your principal place of business, you can deduct your daily transportation costs between your home and another work location in the same trade or business. So we've discussed this uh, in the past in terms of traveling uh, and deduction of your automobile, for example. And there's an issue of whether something is qualified as a commuting or not. And if obviously you have your office as your principal place of business, then the places that you're driving from there might not be allocated or categorized as a commute, but rather as a as a business trip. So that kind of kind of taps into or is part of or overlaps with rules related to the deduction of the automobile. When we think of the automobile, remember 
that we could use either the mileage method possibly or the actual method. Either way though, we have to distinguish between the commuting situation, which would be one in which we have an office outside of the home office versus those that are, are allowable deductions. Okay, so for more information on transportation, costs, you can see publication 463. We talked about that a bit before, travel, gift, and car expenses.